You're listening to the Luis Palau Legacy Library. May your heart be moved, as Luis's was, to proclaim the good news to the ends of the earth. Here's Luis Palau. I want to study this during these four sessions that we have together, and it is how God disciplines us for the glory of God. You know, I read a little booklet once that was published in England way back called Discipline in the School of God. And in studying the Old Testament, we've studied David and Joseph and, oh goodness, all the Old Testament characters. And this time I was praying and praying and saying, what can I do? And the Lord seemed to say, do the Apostle Paul. And I thought, I've never done that. You know, I've read so much about Paul, studied the epistles and preached the gospel from it, but I never analyzed his life and how God disciplined Paul. Because Paul, though he was a terrific man, and I suppose many of us after Jesus Christ, we feel Paul is the man, you know. After Jesus, he's as close to Jesus as almost anybody we've ever met, at least I've ever read about. And uh, so I thought, okay, let's do that. And so I made four points that I hope to make. Tonight, we're just opening it up, okay? First, I began to think Paul had a very clear-cut conversion. I mean, his conversion was like night and day. And then you got Andrew coming up on the screen there. And although he was brought up in a wonderful family with a super dad and a pretty good mother and all that, you know, he was as lost as any pagan in the jungles of Brazil. I mean, he uh, just didn't know Jesus Christ. He just knew about him. We have a friend who's on our board of trustees. He attended a Presbyterian church, but he wasn't really converted till he was about 37 at a Promise Keepers event, and the Holy Spirit brought conviction of sin. And then the next week, he went to a church, fell on his face, spread eagle in front of the pastor, in front of a big congregation that was converted. And he was one of the most naughty boys in Florida, you know, but his life was revolutionized. And so there's a change. So the Apostle Paul is the best example of somebody with a clear-cut conversion, darkness and light, freedom versus slavery and so on. So we're going to look at that for a few minutes tonight. Since most of us know the story, it shouldn't take that long. Secondly, tomorrow morning, after he was converted, the Apostle Paul had a clear-cut lifestyle. His lifestyle was so unique, and much of what we discuss as Christians has to do with the Apostle Paul telling us how his life was transformed by Jesus Christ, how to live a victorious life, how to overcome temptation, how to live in marriage. I mean, the Apostle Paul, and we'll get into it in the morning. Then, if we're still around on Saturday, it'll be that he had a clear-cut mission, the Apostle Paul is so clear on what his mission was, and he, he's able to say it, and we'll look at it and encourage you to think in terms of what your mission is in life under God while looking at the Apostle Paul. And then finally, Sunday morning, if you're still here, the Apostle Paul had something else that was very clear-cut, and that was a very clear-cut expectation about the future. Sometimes we use the word hope, but I think hope has become so weakened and so hope so that I use expectation. And the apostle expected to be able to live a godly life and a holy life and a fruitful life. And then he was waiting for Christ to come back in the clouds. And you'll see how clear it was in his head. And I'm convinced we need it today in the church in the United States and Europe for sure, but even U.S. and Canada, where many people just never talk about the second coming. There seems to be, hey, whatever shall be, shall be, you know. Whatever it is, yeah, okay, fine. Nobody wants to know. And yet, there are 300 references in the Bible. So, we'll look at the Apostle Paul and how God disciplined him and prepared him to be such a man of God that we honor him. And that over half of all the books in the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. So, the Lord was pretty pleased with this man that he used him so much. So, let's go first to the book of Acts, chapter 7. And the Apostle Paul was a unique person before he became the Apostle Paul. He was a very, very violent man, a very strange man, a very yeah, violent man. So let's read chapter 7 of Acts, verses 54 to 8, 1. It isn't too long, but then we'll skip to chapter 9, okay? So Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. You remember that Stephen was going to be stoned and killed. Saul of Tarsus was the leader of the gang 
that stoned poor uh, Stephen to death, and he was right there. Here's what it says. When they heard this, the crowd, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at Stephen. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when they, he had said this, he fell asleep. And verse 1, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Now, skip to chapter 9, will you? Chapter 9, and um, I'm sure you expected that. Verse 1, and here is the continuation of what's going on here. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, which is the capital of Syria even today, so that he, if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he got near to Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now, get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood, speechless. They heard the sound, but didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see a thing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to uh, arrest those who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings, and before the people of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. We'll stop right there, and we may review it tomorrow morning, but I just wanted to read that. Most of us know it off by heart. But nevertheless, it's important to reread it so that we know what the Lord is trying to say. You know, as I was meditating on this and looking at Saul and all the things I've read through the years, one thing that struck me was this. Saul, first of all, was a highly intellectual man. He came from a wealthy home. He studied under Gamaliel, who was the number one professor in, in all of Israel. 
It was like saying I studied under Einstein or something like that, you know, uh, at the best university in the world of that time. So he came from an influential home, uh, probably a wealthy home because they probably couldn't have afforded it. Otherwise, in those days, very few people actually went to university under super profs. And then uh, on the other hand, together with that, he was very religious. You remember he says in um, Philippians, he says, as to the justification by legalism, I was flawless. In other words, he was a very religious fellow. And yet, the third thing about him is he was breathing murderous threats. He was foaming at the mouth. He had this terrific hatred of those who follow Jesus Christ. What an interesting and strange combination. But you know, when he meets Jesus Christ, everything is changed. It was a clear-cut conversion. His life was revolutionized. And through the centuries, when the life of St. Paul is read and the conversion of Saul to Christ, many people who've been atheists have been converted. There's an old story which came out of England. Actually, it's a case study, not a story. Two lawyers who were atheists in the 1800s decided they were going to try and disprove the New Testament and, and all the teachings about Jesus Christ, etc. And somebody challenged them that one of them should study the life of the Apostle Paul because he was an intellectual, highly trained, from a wealthy home, religiously flawless, he said, and yet, what a change in his life. So, the first lawyer began to study the life of Saul. And after he studied it as a lawyer, he was converted. The other guy who was going to write the book, you know, attacking Christianity, said, what made you change? He said, I studied the life of Paul. Nobody could have faked what happened to Saul of Tarsus. So the other lawyer read it, and he was converted also. So the book was never written, and they wrote a very eloquent piece that you will find if you look it up somewhere in a series of books called The Fundamentals. You know how evangelical Christians are sometimes called fundamentalists? It all started in the 1920s or so when there was a big debate between people who believed the Bible and people who denied the Bible. And uh, so they published a series of articles, which is in four volumes today, quite catchy even today, though it was published in the 1920s. And uh, in those volumes is the story of these two lawyers. It's worth reading it because it may help you when you're trying to witness to an unbeliever. But the thing that struck me was this. From the moment the Apostle Paul was converted, he lived in, in what I like to call, he lived and breathed in a world of the supernatural. It's interesting when you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, from that day when he met Jesus Christ, from then on, he lived in the supernatural. And he was totally unashamed of talking about it. We're going to look at it as we go on over the weekend into his life. But his encounter with Christ was so amazing, so profound. And the Apostle Paul from then on lived in the supernatural. He knew God. He met Jesus Christ in a way that few people have had the privilege of meeting him. He spent, then he went for three years to the desert. You remember? You can imagine he was a, he was a uh, Pharisee an expert in the, the law of God. And he had to change his whole mindset. So when he was converted, he went off for three years to Arabia, to the desert, probably on his own, to just rethink everything. That's what all the experts feel. And I'm not an expert, but I feel the same way. And then the interesting thing is, the Apostle Paul, after three years in the desert, where God really spoke to him and God did a great thing in his soul, he came back to Jerusalem and he asked the apostle Peter to, to spend two weeks with Peter. And I'll get back into that in a few minutes. But first of all, then, the conversion of the apostle Paul. He says in a passage in Timothy, he says, I was a persecutor of the church of God, but I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Ignorance and unbelief. When you think of Saul of Tarsus, you don't think of an ignorant man, highly educated, from one of the highest families in the land, with a great intellect, obviously. You notice it when you study the epistles and all his life. He was a brilliant man, but he says, I did it out of ignorance and unbelief. And you know, though he was highly intellectual and highly educated, spiritually he was ignorant, and spiritually he was a complete unbeliever. And you know, it's something to remember when you witness to people that a person may have a degree from Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Yale, or wherever you are impressed by, 
Nevertheless, spiritually, they can be filled with ignorance and unbelief. And so you have to really think of that and not be overly impressed by PhDs and masters and, you know, in business administration and all this stuff. You respect it. But when it comes to spiritual things, it's quite another story. You all know the Bible teaches that we are created tripartite, right? Spirit, soul, and body. So a person may have a healthy body, a brilliant soul, which is the intellect and the emotions and the will, and have a great education and be respectable intellectually and emotionally be very stable and uh, physically be in good condition. But spiritually, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. And so the Apostle Paul, as we call him now, was only Saul of Tarsus in those days, highly regarded. He was well-connected. He got permission from the chief priests just like that. He had all sorts of connections. When he asked for a letter of recommendation to go to Damascus, which, you know, in those days there was no airplanes, there was no Mercedes Benzes. You either walked or got on a donkey, and you had to go for these hundreds of miles to Damascus. He got his permission just to bring men and women to trial. He was a violent man, he says. I forced men and women to blaspheme. He said, I voted when they were being killed. You know, what an amazing thing. And he was highly religious. So conversion needs to come to every one of us. And then I like the idea that the Apostle Paul, when he met Jesus Christ, was instantly changed. I I think it's wonderful when you read all the stories uh, that are told in the Bible about his conversion. Sometimes somebody else wrote it. Sometimes he testified to it. When he met the Lord Jesus and the Lord threw him down and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The first question he asked was, he's on the ground now in the dust, and that road up to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Next question, what shall I do, Lord? What a switch from just one hour earlier, 10 minutes earlier. He was breathing and snivering, and I'm going to get those Christians. I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. We're going to beat them up. We're going to throw them in jail. We're going to kill them. Suddenly, bang. He meets Jesus Christ, and what a change. It's a clear-cut conversion. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. What shall I do, Lord? (laughs) Suddenly, he wasn't a tough guy with a big IQ and all his education. Suddenly, he's a man on the ground. And when he opens his eyes, he's blind. What a shock, that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, every one of us, whether we're as brilliant as the Apostle Paul or not on that level, We have to have a clear-cut conversion if we're going to know God for ourselves. And in our churches, I'm convinced that we need to come back to this. Do you know one of the exciting things that's been happening to me in the USA in the last few months is I've been invited to preach at some of the big churches on the West Coast in particular, although also Chicago and the outskirts of Chicago and so on. And you know, they invite me to come in for a weekend. There's a church called um, Calvary Church in Naperville, Illinois. And it's a a church that's a mixture of very poor Latin immigrants and other poor sort of people. And then across the street, this main avenue, is some of the quite fancy homes, million and a half and two million bucks in Naperville. So they've got in this church very poor immigrants, Hispanics, many of them. I'm Hispanic, so I can say it. And uh, on the other hand, some ritzy people, many Asians and Anglos and so on with kind of expensive homes. And they are very open. They invited me to go and to preach the gospel. They all have a Spanish service on Friday night, two English services on Saturday night, and then three English services on Sunday morning. The first time we went there about five years ago, maybe, I was all excited, especially with the Hispanics who were the first ones to invite me. So we did Friday night and about a hundred Hispanics were converted. Saturday night, two services, Sunday morning, three. By the end of one weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, almost 500 Americans were converted. And I thought, man, this is exciting. I mean, that's a ton of people in one weekend in one church. Then they invited me to go to Mariner's Church down in Newport Beach, California. And the pastor was off to Israel to check out something or other. And he said, okay, you preach the gospel, man. And then he said to me, you know, I practiced something last Sunday, he said, when I led people in a decision for Christ, I asked them to stand up and punch the air and out loud say, I believe. So he said, I want you to do that. 
Now, I'd never done it in my life. You know, I'm very proper. But anyway, I thought this, this was a good idea. So I did it. And it was a Sunday morning. I think there was Saturday night and then two or three Sunday morning. And after finish preaching the gospel, I lead them in a prayer like I always do. And then I said, I heard quite a number of you praying. I want you to do this. When I say three, stand up and all of you in unison punch the air and say, I believe. Well, you know, there was a ton of people. And I thought, this is exciting, you know. I mean, even as an evangelist, I got excited. And then the second service, same thing. Third service, again, like 400 people counseled. They came forward. They were taken to a side room. They were given a package with a Bible and counseling and so on. I'm finding this happening all across the USA. And, you know, I think that many Bible teaching churches, community churches, churches that are well grounded in the Bible, not liberal or anything, just plain old good churches, I don't think we're calling on people to be converted clearly in a clear way. And I think if we begin to do it, we're going to see a lot of people who are in church being converted. One of the things that has got me, I get worked up about things. One of them that really gets me is this thing that's appearing in magazines and even books nowadays, that many kids High school kids who then go to college at 17 or 18, when they go to college, they throw the Christianity overboard. Some of them say they were believers. They went to a good evangelical church, but as soon as they hit the university, they threw the whole thing out. Now, I am sort of a Saul of Tarsus type of guy. You're either in or you're not. And anybody who goes to university, and because some professor starts making fun of Jesus Christ— throws him under the bus, probably doesn't know Jesus Christ. You know, I came to Jesus Christ when I was 12 years old. I didn't know too much then. I know a little more now. But it wouldn't cross my mind to say, ooh, the professor blasphemed Jesus. Ooh, ooh, I'm throwing him under the bus. There are many kids, I think, in our homes, like Andrew Palau. That's why it's good that you showed this video, and he can testify about his own sinfulness tomorrow. I won't do it for him. But, you know, he is... Our son, you know, wonderful mother. She's good. I've been married 50 years, and she, she's good. And, and I'm not bad myself. But this guy was not converted. Sometimes when we talk to people, they say, oh, he's a nice boy. He's just doing, you know, what boys do. No, no, no. My wife used to say, if it looks like a bird, has feathers like a bird, flies like a bird, squawks like a bird, it's a bird. You know, and he's no Christian, even though he is our son, and we love him to death. And then he was converted. And the conversion was radical. And, you know, I really think that we need to be up on this. If kids from our churches go to university and suddenly just deny the faith and act like they never heard of it, it probably means they don't know Jesus Christ, that they're not converted. So I think we need to get to worked up. I know it's the first night that some of you got up at three, but I want to work you up so you can't sleep tonight and say, by George, you know, I got to get my kids converted. Or somebody else's kids, if, you're, if yours already are. But I think a clear-cut conversion goes such a long way. You know what I've been finding lately? That uh, people who were converted out of the world, who were not really churchy at all, and they're converted clearly black and white. I've got a list that I, that I like to use sometimes when I'm preaching the gospel of what really happens when you're converted. And the Apostle Paul tells us, as you study his, his life, he develops what it means to be converted. He says, well, in Romans 8, 1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, he says, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, he says, we are rescued from the curse of the law because Christ was made a curse for us. That's what conversion means. Number four, Romans 5.1, we are justified by faith. In the eyes of God, we are so forgiven that it's as if we'd never sinned. We are justified by the death of His Son through faith in Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 8 again, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Conversion is a radical thing. And some of us, even though we were brought up in the church like I was when I was 12 years old, the one thing I did not have any assurance of eternal life, and for good reason, because I didn't have eternal life. That's why I didn't have assurance of eternal life. But when my counselor sat me down and very starkly presented to me the claims of Christ, 
He said to me, I was 12 years old at a summer camp. He was a missionary. That's why I love missionaries. And he said to me, Luis, 12 years old, sweet little fellow. Yeah. He said, if you die tonight, are you going to heaven or hell? And I said, I'm going to hell. And he, I won't go into the whole dialogue because it would take too much time. But I was so glad. Some people get a little softy, you know. Oh, don't say that to little children. Look, go ahead and say it. The Holy Spirit won't allow them to be shocked. It's, it was very good for me, for this guy to sit me down and say, you're going to heaven or you're going to hell? I said, I'm going to hell. And he said to me, is that where you want to go? I said, no. Anyway, he led me with Romans 10, 9 and 10 to make a clear-cut commitment to Jesus Christ. And when we finished the prayer and I got it, I went to my tent with the other seven boys who were in the tent. And I said, I've got eternal life. I've got eternal life. I was 12. Now I'm an old guy. I still know I had eternal life because it was so clear cut. That night, my counselor made it as clear as you can get. Conversion is you're either in or out. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. You're a child of God or you're not. It's very good. And I think we need to do it. And if you teach a Sunday school class, don't harass them every Sunday, but from time to time, make it very clear to the fellows. Some people may squawk. They'll squawk worse at the end of the race if they don't convert it to Jesus Christ. And you know, I made a list one day because when I was a kid in our church, the missionaries were terrific Bible teachers and great preachers, you know. And they used to use a lot 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And they would go around and around on that. But even as a kid, they always made me sit in the front row. I always used to think, what does it mean that you are a new creature and that the old is gone? What's gone? I, all things become new. What's new, you know? My mom's face didn't change. My face didn't change. What's new and what's old and what passes away and so on. So I made a little list. I'll just read it to you without going into any details. But I wrote down one day, once I was lost, now I am found. Once I was blind, now I can see. Once I was dead, now I'm alive. Once I was a slave, now I am free. That's very clear, you know. And that's what happens when a person is converted. The Apostle Paul, who was a violent man, as well as educated and so on, it was very visible, the change. Suddenly, he wanted to mingle with the people he had been trying to kill. And suddenly, he doesn't want to kill them anymore. But the people were afraid of him. They said, this is the man who's trying to kill us and take us to Jerusalem to beat us up and throw us in jail. He changed radically. And so, the list goes on and on. Once I was in darkness, now I'm in the light. Once I was empty... Now I'm a temple of God. Once I lived in two dimensions, soul and body. Now I live in three, body, soul, and spirit. Once I was in the kingdom of Satan. Now I'm in the kingdom of God. Once I was guilty. Now I'm forgiven. Once I was in a slimy pit. Now my feet are on the rock. Once I was condemned. Now I'm exonerated. And you know, that kind of clarity is what made the Apostle Paul such a fantastic servant of God. He saw it as clear as daylight. This is what I was. That's what I am now. Because one day on the road to Damascus, Jesus Christ knocked me down, talked to my conscience, offered me forgiveness, and in three days, I was a totally new man. And you know, brothers and sisters, that is what made the Apostle Paul the man that he became. You know, he needed a radical encounter with the living God. And the Bible says all of us have sinned, We've all come short of the glory of God, and all of us need to have a radical conversion. Now, it's more visible in some people. We have a friend. He was a drug addict, and he was fooling around, and he'd married a Brazilian girl. He lived a wild life. And then one day, thanks to the maid, a maid that worked in the house, he was converted to Jesus Christ. And the change was so visible. Yeah, he needed to grow, and he's still growing, just like Saul of Tarsus had to grow. But his life was radically changed the moment, thanks to the maid, and thanks to 9-11, by the way, that frightened the socks off him, he was converted to Jesus Christ. And his life was really turned around. Some of us were brought up in the church. The change isn't as visible, you know, in behavior. I mean, a 12-year-old boy, you know, a few things you can tell, but most people wouldn't tell too much of a difference. But it was real in my life. And, you know, that's what the Apostle Paul teaches us here. And the beautiful thing is when he talks to the kings and he talks to governors, 
He was totally unashamed of speaking about the supernatural work of God in his life. Totally unashamed. He knew that they would mock him. He knew they tried to kill him, in fact. As soon as he was converted, you remember, he went to Damascus, went to the synagogues, told them, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. And they said, we're going to kill this guy. First, he was killing the Christians. Now, the enemies were saying, let's kill him. This guy is too articulate. He's too eloquent. Let's get rid of him. And you remember, they had to let him down on a wall in a basket. It was very humiliating to him. In 2 Corinthians, later in his life, he says, you know, how humiliating it was. Here's this hotshot, highly educated, influential man with contacts all over the world, and he has to scramble out of the wall in Damascus like a little sneaky person just running off in the night, and they let him out, and he had to flee Damascus. So to him, it was a radical conversion. And you know, brothers and sisters, we need to, and if you talk to people in your church, don't hesitate. Andrew may tell he's got a book out. You know, he tells the story of how when he was not a converted kid, the stuff he did. When my wife and I read the, the text, we were shocked. We didn't know some of the stuff this guy did, you know? And uh, I'm glad we didn't. You know, that would have been tormentous to us. And Pat tried to get him to erase one or two of the stories, but he refused to do it. But, you know, that's the way it is. We need to confront people. Now, I didn't confront Andrew. I, I didn't think so anyway. He seemed to think, I think his conscience bothered him. I invited him to go for a walk, and he thought it was torture or something, from what I hear. But uh, I would write him letters and tell him about the Lord and so on. I think we need to be clear. If your child does not believe, he's not a believer, baby. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, he may be a wonderful little girl, and she may be pretty and dances with the stars and all the rest of it. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're lost. You're dead. So a clear-cut conversion is what the Apostle Paul had. And, you know, when you look at how the events took place, it's really interesting. He became the number one apostle, you would say. At least I think so. Peter was good, too. John is superb. And the others, I'm sure, too. But to me, Paul was Paul, you know. But the first thing he does, this fellow Ananias comes into the house and lays hands on him and made a very clear thing about it, laid hands on him. And then the next thing that happens is he prayed for him to receive his sight. Boom, he receives his sight. The next thing that happens is filled with the Holy Spirit. Next thing is baptize him in water. Then give him something to eat. And then he goes off immediately into town to try and convince others that Jesus is the Messiah. And you know, I think we need to go through that process with people in which it's very clear that this is not a game. This is not something you learn by osmosis. It is something you pick up by accident by hanging around Sunday school, youth group, and college group in your church. It has to be a personal experience. And so the Apostle Paul experienced supernaturally. His spiritual life was revolutionized. And all his life, he was absolutely unashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he would talk to kings and others and tell them the whole story. Oh, king, I was on my way to Damascus, and suddenly at noon a light from heaven shone around me, and I heard a voice, and the people around me didn't hear a thing. But I heard the voice of Jesus, and he said, Saul, Saul. And he's talking, you know, to a bunch of cynical military people who were probably laughing their heads off. In fact, Festus, one of them, said, Paul, you're mad. Your great learning has driven you mad. And Paul says, I am not mad, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking words of truth and righteousness. I mean, he was not ashamed of Jesus Christ because the encounter had been so real. And I think we need to encourage one another, pray for one another, even in our best Bible teaching churches, because many, many believers are ashamed of telling their story. So if you have relatives that you love, whether it's your children or grandchildren or cousins or aunts or sisters or brothers or whoever, husband or wife, don't be embarrassed to talk about your experiences with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul talked about it. Whenever he was in a bind, he'd just tell his story. And when he writes the epistles, over and over he makes reference. This is a worthy saying, he says to Timothy. And Timothy was his spiritual child. I'm worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. You know, he had such a deep sense of conviction of his evil. And Paul was an honest man. He was an intellectual. He had a high IQ. He came from a wealthy home. He had the best education you could get in Israel in those days. But he was also profoundly honest. 
And he kept saying to himself, I am so unworthy. He says, I am the least of all the apostles because I persecuted the church of Christ. I threw the saints in jail. He hated his sin. And you know, that's what a deep conversion can do. When a person feels so rotten about their sins, and then they experience the life of Jesus Christ, how exciting that is. So I thought we should start reminding ourselves of the radical conversion that the Apostle Paul had. And I, I really do want to urge all of you that you develop your own testimony. You know, in the old days, Bill Bright, who was a fabulous man of God, they would help people to develop their own testimony. And I want tonight to finish with this, even as we get our minds and hearts ready about the discipline that God did in the life of the apostle, well, who later became the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. I want you to think about this. If you haven't done it, think through how you were converted, even if it isn't a very dramatic story like the Apostle Paul's conversion, and you don't have a story that's wild. But all of us have our experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Write it down. What were the, the, the main points, you know, your background, what did your mother tell you, what did your father tell you or didn't tell you, what woke you up to your spiritual need, who presented the gospel, if you can remember what Bible verse the Lord might have used or Bible truth that God used for you to be converted and know for sure that you're now a child of God, write it all down, no matter how long it takes. Just write, 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 write. And then the other day, we were at Wheaton College doing some ministry over there. And a gal who is in charge of Wheaton Bible Church, which is not part of the college, but she was there because her husband teaches at the college. And she was telling us that she is in charge of following up anybody who's converted at Wheaton Bible Church. And that was one of the churches I spoke in that also a ton of people were converted. And she said, we followed them all up one by one. And I asked, what do you do for training those who counsel people who are converted? And she said, one of the things we're training them is this, to write out their whole testimony, as I suggested to you, and then try and reduce it to 300 words so that you've got in your head clearly the basic, basic, basics of how Jesus Christ came into your life and into your heart and maybe into your family. And then if you've got it in 300 words, you're having a cup of coffee with someone in a restaurant, you can't spend an hour telling the whole story, but you can tell in 300 words or so, maybe a few more, give or take, that's not a biblical order, but it's an idea to have it in your head so you can tell what happened to you. And it may not be dramatic, Maybe you didn't kill your mother-in-law, you didn't get drunk, you didn't jump off a bridge and all sorts of stuff like that. But tell your story and honor Jesus Christ and you'll be quite amazed. This summer, this past summer, we have a family vacation with all the four sons, their wives and the grandchildren. And uh, we usually have some kind of a devotional of some sort whenever possible. The kids are not too fussy or something. But this year, my wife decided, since we've been married 50 years and one of these days will be gone, that she would do an interesting thing. She said to the grandchildren, I want to tell you how Jesus came into our family, which I thought was a very interesting, creative way, you know. He, she said, you know, when she was telling me when she began to write her side of the story, the Schofield side, and I began to think about the Palau side, the, the children have heard me because they hear me preach here and there. They've heard... That, But, you know, I thought the concept that Pat had was how Jesus came into our family. And in her case, her grandparents were converted a little later in life. Her dad and mom, definitely, when they were middle-aged, well, youngish couple, an engineer he was, and she was a college graduate, etc. How they came to know Jesus, how Jesus came into our family. And I, even I was intrigued, you know. How did Jesus come into the Schofield family? It wasn't like a long tradition of... Christians, it sort of happened in the grandparents and then the parents. With our, our family, the Palau side, my grandparents were completely religious. It was a Catholic background, but they never went to church, you know. And then this missionary shows up, and my mom was the organist at the Catholic parish. She was the first one to be converted, reading the New Testament. She got conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit revealed Christ to her from what she'd heard in the Catholic Church a little bit, she was converted. Then my grandma on my mom's side, and then my dad. But Jesus came into our family only in my parents' generation. Then they led my other grandma to Christ, etc. But it was, what an interesting concept, you know. 
And if you've never told your children or grandchildren, it might be a good idea when you're on a vacation or whenever you feel like doing it, you know, to tell them how Jesus came into your family. Maybe some of you have tradition of a whole series of generations, but it is intriguing and there's nothing like it to bless the people. So for the Apostle Paul, when you read the epistles, you realize that the cross of Christ was central to his conversion. Yes, he persecuted Jesus. He knew about his crucifixion. And then tomorrow, God willing, I want to look with you about the Apostle Paul spending two weeks with the Apostle Peter, just the two apostles. I hadn't thought of it till I started this study and reading here and there. It just dawned on me to think that Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to spend two weeks with Peter and nobody else. And I want to go over that with you tomorrow because it was very intriguing when I began to think about that and meditate. I wonder what they talked about. I wonder what Paul was asking. Why did he want to meet with Peter and nobody else? He said, I saw James uh, for a little while, but nobody else, just Paul and Peter talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What an exciting idea that was. So, conversion, a clear-cut conversion. And before I say a prayer or lead us in a prayer, is everybody in this room know Jesus Christ for yourselves? Once we had one of these president's councils in Hawaii, and um, a gal was an employee of a foundation that supported our team. And she was, I'll tell you her background, she was Lutheran. She went to church, but her husband is a lawyer, and he didn't go to church much at all. But the the chairman of the foundation, since she was the executive secretary, said, look, I can't go to the Palau PC. Why don't you go and take your husband with you? And he came. And listening to the Bible studies, he was converted to Jesus Christ. That was very exciting. And you know, there could be some of you here today, you're here because whatever. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, what weekend better than this one to say, Lord, once and for all, I want to meet you like the Apostle Paul met you. I want to be converted. I want to know you. I want to live in the world of the supernatural, not just be a nice religious person. If you've never had that experience, boy, wouldn't it be great if you haven't given your heart to Christ? Do it this weekend, okay? That's my final exhortation. Let's pray. We pray, O oh God, that as we study the life of the Apostle Paul, you would teach us, O oh God, the principles that you built into the life of the Apostle Paul so that we can become women and men of God. Lord, we want to know how you're trying to discipline us so that we would become mature Christians, not baby Christians perpetually in immaturity, but make us, O oh God, women and men of God, not babies. We want to grow up, O oh Lord. So teach us and speak to us as we meditate on the life of your servant, Saul of Tarsus, that you then called Paul the Apostle. Lord, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that far be it for us to glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to us and we are crucified to the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross, that you were buried and rose from the dead, that you ascended to heaven and you are seated at the right hand of God the Father. But we thank you that you have come into our lives and by the Holy Spirit, we are temples of God. Oh Lord, we pray that we will live for your glory we pray, O oh God, for all the children and grandchildren of some of the families who are here today who still don't know Jesus Christ. We pray for those fellows. We pray for those women, boys and girls also, that they would come to know you. And I pray, O oh God, that you would use your servants who are here today to develop their own testimony, to tell the story under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so that you can use them to lead others into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, this is Andrew Palau, and I am so glad that you were able to listen to one of Dad's messages today. I love it. We miss him every single day, you can imagine. But the beautiful thing is this. The work that Dad did for God's kingdom has not ended. Of course, we continue to spread the good news all around the world. In fact, we're reaching more people with the hope of Jesus Christ than ever before, day after day. But there's still so many, many people out there who don't yet know him. So 
The harvest is plentiful. We see that every single day. And we would love your partnership and support and help. And if you'd like to support Palau on this mission, sharing the gospel with every person on the planet, that's our goal. Visit us at luispalau.org, and you'll see how you can do that. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you.